DM Seagraph's policy against harassment. This live stream is moderated by ACM Seagraph, and we ask that all comments stay respectful of others and respect ACM's policy against harassment. DM Seagraph's policy this means to harassment. exercise consideration and respect in your speech and actions, refrain from demeaning, discriminatory, or harassing behavior in speech, and be mindful of your fellow participants. Today, we have a Frontiers interaction presented by Dr. Kate Compton, who is a longtime generative artist, an innovator, a programmer, and an assistant professor of instruction at Northwestern University. She wrote the first paper on procedural platform game levels, generated the planets for the video game Spore, created the language Tracery, Tracery which runs over 10,000 community-made bots on Twitter, and invented an early phone-based AR system. Her mission is to design artificial intelligence to augment human creativity and to create tools that bring AI into the hands of poets, artists, kids, and weirdos. Okay, take it away. All right, thank you so much, Cam. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, so yeah, today I'm gonna be talking about designing little bots with big character. Uh, and along the way, I'm gonna be showing you some of my absolute favorite bots on Twitter and some bots that I think kind of show you the potential for what this space can be. Um, because a lot of times people have come in with kind of the idea of like bots as like Alexa or possibly the Terminator. And we're gonna kind of expand your mind for what you think that a bot might be. Oh, shoot, sorry, had my mouse in the wrong window. There we go. Um, yeah, so about me, um, as Kev mentioned, um, I'm Kate Compton. Um, I do outreach for AI and creative, comp uh, creative computing. So I make a lot of zines. I make a lot of outreach materials. Um, I give a lot of talks. Um, I'm a researcher in creativity tools for casual users. So my, my audience is not generally people who have you know, full-time employment in this field, but people are kind of curious about it. People who might not think of themselves as AI creators. Maybe they think of themselves as just poets or kids um, or weirdos or just people who are kind of curious about this. Uh, so I think everybody can design bots and often normal people and especially theater people will design much more interesting bots than even the most advanced uh, computer scientist. Um, and yeah, a lot of this talk is gonna be about Tracer.js, which runs 10,000 art bots. Um, although probably a lot more, we haven't done a survey recently. Um, and as mentioned, I worked on Spore. Um, th that was actually the last time that I talked at SIGGRAPH was in 2007 um, when I presented how, uh, how we did the planets on Spore. So it's been a long journey in that, gosh, 14 years since. Um, but yeah, this talk is really not about tracery. It's about bot making, but tracery will be kind of one of the lenses that we'll be looking through bot making in. Um, so tracery is a teeny little language for describing generative text. And you can see an, uh, an example down here at the bottom. Um, where you say like, okay, well, I would like to describe like, I walked to the bar and I ordered a hashtag drink uh, and a story expands to that. And then you can see that like, oh, if I wanna expand drink as well, that can expand to a large coffee and coffee has one of those hashtags in it. So I'll expand coffee and that'll expand to, uh, expand to oh, coffee flavor frap. And I can say, oh, a hazelnut frap. And so then it kind of compresses the entire thing down to, I walked to the bar and I ordered a hazelnut frap. Uh, but you can see how it can kind of easily describe recursive structures with this, um, but really you're just kind of like creating a space, um, a possibility space of things that could be generated. Uh, and all of these are handwritten. You're not actually, this is not a machine learning product, um, although it could sock it into those in interesting ways. Uh, this is something where you're describing, if you have a color, you're describing all the colors yourself. There's no kind of corpus of things that you're drawing from. Um, so you're kind of sketching out this possibility space yourself. Um, it's really interesting. Uh, I made this actually as a, um, a class assignment uh, for grad school. Um, I got 110 on it. Uh, it was supposed to be just a pencil and paper assignment. And I did it in JavaScript instead and I released the library. I open sourced it. Um, it's, it's up there on GitHub, you can browse that. Um, and then somebody in London, V Buckingham, picked up this tool and said, hey, I'm gonna like, I think I'm gonna teach a Twitter bot making workshop. Um, but one of the hardest things about making Twitter bots is you have to like log into Twitter, you have to set up cron jobs that are running on some sort of node server, you have to do all this back end engineering. And they thought to themselves, gosh, I'm just going to make a tool that does that for them. They can paste in this little grammar. So these like little programs in Tracer are called grammars. I'm going to paste, have them paste in their grammar, log in with Twitter, and then every, you know, six times a day, it'll spin up that cron job on that computer expand out their grammar to get whatever little story or story snippet that they wanted, and then I'll post that to Twitter for them. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Uh, so this acts like this pairing of cheap Austin and quick and tracer, you accidentally made a really powerful bot making tool. Um, and at that point, I think it was 2015 um, that they released cheap bots done quick. Um, people started just building so many bots um, and it was a lot by the last count and even more bots have existed and then been sadly banned because some stuff that I'll mention later. Uh, but yeah, we've gotten just, it's been a wonderful success story of different people getting to make bots. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and yeah, this is one of the people who uh, had mentioned when I talked to her that she'd kind of written herself off of computer science, um, that it wasn't like a space where she felt like she could pleasurably make art anymore. Um, and she got back into it because of tracery and ended up combining in some interesting ways with music. Um, and she points out, uh, this is from BotWiki, which we'll mention also later, um, that bot making attracts a lot of really interesting people, uh, especially when you give them the tools and kind of the accessible tools to get into it. So yeah, I thought I would start thinking like, okay, well, you know, we're going to be talking about artistic bot making. So what is a bot? Uh, and bots can mean lots of different things. Here are a couple of Hollywood bots. Um, but often when people talk about bots, they kind of, sometimes they mean an AI character that you can listen to and that it's going to respond to you on command. So things like the Amazon Alexa, which hopefully will not activate. Um, there's a Barbie that will talk to you. Um, Tay uh, on uh, there was a Twitter bot called Tay that Microsoft made that had a whole interesting journey um, and things like Siri. These are all kind of bots when people say like, oh, we're going to have bot enabled software or like Microsoft is creating a new bot. Often this is what they mean. Um, interestingly, it's al also a slur for uh, a human or an account that we don't want to call a real human. Um, you know, this is not a slur for a person who's pretending to be someone else. So like, oh, you know, we have online dating sites and anybody who's been on an online dating site knows that as soon as you put up your profile, you get a bunch of pings from bizarrely attractive people that all they'll do is say hi. Um, and then if you respond to them, they'll respond back with some non sequiturs and they'll kind of try to keep the conversation going and then hopefully eventually ask you for money. When people say like, oh, well, that's a scam bot. Um, and there's a lot of ways like, oh, how do you spot bots on Twitter? Like, oh, we have a lot of problems with bots on Twitter. Um, and interesting what, what they mean is they mean an account that is pretending to be somebody other than it is. Um, and this is really interesting because not all of these bots are programs. Actually, most of these bots are human. Um, there's kind of an, an interesting tourism in this space that there's no need to program a bot if you can get a poorly paid human to do this as well. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of AI systems that they say like, oh, we've got a, an AI that does something. But often what that AI is doing is the AI is doing some work on the problem and then also farming stuff out to a variety of people on Amazon Mechanical Turk or a variety of other like custom services to have humans annotate or converse with people. Uh, and so when people say like, oh, there's a lot, a lot of bots on Twitter, there's a lot of bots on um, like different dating services, often those are just a human that is like manually typing stuff in in a rote and repetitive way. Um, and yeah, you can often, if somebody says like, oh, there's too many bots on Twitter, you can just picture it as like, there is either a poorly paid or somebody who's just doing it for fun um, person behind a computer who is this bot. Uh, and often we say bots when we say, when we want to kind of think of that person as a machine. Um, this is really interesting because you can also get into these hybrid situations where, okay, you know, I have a problem with some technology. I go to their automated help desk. There's a little chat window that pops up. Somebody says, hello, I'm Brenda. I'm here to help you with your issue. I start typing in and Brenda starts like uh, replying to me um, and she asked me for some details. Um, and what is actually often happening in these automated systems or in these systems is that you have, yes, sometimes some live humans behind it, sometimes some AIs behind it. We actually have these interesting um, systems where the humans are typing some stuff. Sometimes the humans are selecting options from a lot of menus. So they kind of auto type things in, they're auto completing a lot. Um, and then sometimes you have AIs that will like switch in different humans to the human portion of it, or they'll, the AI itself will uh, type things. So this combination of a human and a bot is really common in sort of big enterprise AI. Uh, and the two terms for this, um, are either uh, cyborg or centaur. I personally like centaurs better because centaurs are cool. Um, but this is the idea that like a human plus an AI can be more powerful than the AI or the human separately. The human uh, help desk person can't actually type fast enough, can't kind of have the uh, 
like they would be too inefficient to use at scale. So you have an AI that's kind of doing the bulk of the work for them, but the AI is not going to be able to deal with like very fussy um, uh, issues that like maybe it doesn't have answers for. So you have the human there to kind of like also answer the like the the human level questions. Um, yeah. So um, the final thing that bot might mean, and um, this is basically it's a piece of code that runs automatically. Uh, if you're a software engineer, you might have heard the term cron job before. It means chronological job. It's like these are these are tasks that run on your computer just automatically. Uh, and you can set these up. So, you know, I want I want something to post to Twitter every five hours, or I want something to like beep on my desktop every five hours. You can set up a cron job that will just run automatically for you. Um, but we have a lot of these kind of things that run automatically in our lives. Um, of course, a Roomba is a good example of that I can just hit go on my Roomba and it'll kind of go around my apartment. Um, but we also have things like sprinkler systems. Um, there's older versions of these as well. This is a really interesting um, automaton from the uh, uh, late 1700s that's able to draw uh, really intricate drawings just with a bunch of camshafts. So these are all kinds of systems that run automatically. Um, and so you know, when I talked about uh, cheap bots and quick posting stuff to people's Twitters, that's kind of this example. It's a it's a code, it's a piece of code that runs automatically periodically. So like a lot of the, well, so you get bots on Twitter that are AI characters, you get bots on Twitter that are real humans posting disingenuously, and you get bots on Twitter that are cron jobs that just periodically uh, tweet. I didn't put this in my talk, but there's a Big Ben. A Twitter bot that just chimes the hour and it uh, goes bong the correct number of times for each hour. So that's a, that is a Twitter bot that just like every hour posts the current time in London as a series of bongs. So yeah, um, when Twitter cracks down on things or when, when people say, hey, we should get rid of all the bots, what we actually want to do is get rid of all the humans that are posting disingenuously either by themselves or using like a combination of uh, Centaur technology to like help them post disingenuously. Um, but often what happens is Twitter ends up cracking down on all the code that runs automatically, which means that a lot of Twitter bots uh, that I'm going to be showing you today have been turned off at one point or another, but hopefully most of them are still alive when you watch this. So yeah, today we're not going to be looking at the kind of fake human bots uh, or the humans or like the sort of humans pretending to be bots, bots. Um, we're gonna be looking at uh, things that are um, autonomous jobs running um, that are also kind of interpretable as characters. Um, and we're gonna be looking at very simple bots with minimum code complexity um, and a lot of big character and theatrical power. So there's gonna be a lot of like interesting theatrical thoughts that we're gonna be having today and like not actually a lot of technological thoughts. Um, I just did, uh, before this talk, I did a search on Twitter for I love this bot. Um, if you want to see some cool bots, um, there's lots of great places to look for bots, but it's really fun just to search for I love this bot in quotation marks and see what bots people are liking. Uh, so these are just, they're not my favorite bots, but these are three bots that people thought were just really worth saying uh, I love this bot to. So yeah, how, if we're going to talk about things being interestingly complex without complexity, how can we interact with a bot that's not even listening? So I wanted to show you, uh, this is Lost Tesla. This is a bot that I made. Um, it's been running since I think 2016. Um, that was when Elon Musk put out a tweet or said something in a talk, which said that like, if you press go on your Tesla, your Tesla will come to you even if it's across the country. And I was on a road trip at the time, um, kind of driving through the, the hills of Vermont. And I started thinking to myself like, gosh, what would it be like to be an autonomous car? And you have sensors, you can sense the world around you. No, nobody is driving you, but you're on a road trip to some destination and you're not sure when you're gonna get there. And so I thought about this kind of as a character. So I, I created this character of the lost Tesla um, and uh, wrote some, some very simple rules to have a kind of wonder about like the things that it's encountering and what it's going past and like what is true of the world. So we can see some of its tweets on the left. Um, this is in fact running on uh, cheap bots done quick using tracery. Um, so it says things like, there's a squirrel, now it is gone, I miss it. I stopped to recharge, will I dream? I dream of raccoons. I can see the moon. How long have I been driving? I watch a squirrel, now it is gone, I miss it. I am, I am always seeking. I am not empty. So it has these kind of like little poetic meditations. Um, and this was really interesting because it's not doing anything terribly complicated. It can't actually reply to you like normal Twitter accounts would. Uh, but people 
are interacting with his bot kind of in their own way, uh, where they'll often quote, like quote tweet it and react to what the bot is saying. Um, so there's a lot of like me too. Um, and then sometimes they notice when uh, it seems to be telling a little accidental story. Uh, so the one in the upper left hand or upper right hand corner, I saw a dog so small. I am in, I'm in a busy town. I noticed an old man cry, crying, a driveway, a policeman and it says, Oh, it tells a story. So you can kind of imagine the story in your head. You see somebody looking at this randomly generated tweet and kind of putting together in their head what these accidentally chosen kind of tarot cards of meaning uh, tell the story of. Um, the uh, An old man crosses in front of me. I break. I hear soft rain on wet earth. The person kind of imagines that the Tesla at this point has just hit an old man and is like, as this old man dies on the sidewalk, it's kind of like contemplating like the sound that it hears. Um and yeah, I, I sent the Tesla to space for a brief time when the Tesla got launched into space and it possibly also killed an astronaut. Uh, so these are just kind of the stories that people tell around these little snippets of logic. Um, so yeah, there's there are bots that will respond to you um, and you can interact with those as well. So this is a bot that it, it does react. Um, this is one of the simplest and most powerful bots on Twitter. This is Endless Screaming. Um, which has been screaming, uh, I think, for about six years now um, with increasing frequency. Uh, and you can see on the right here an example of its tweets. So this is not a complicated bot to write. Um, its grammar is not very complex. Um, I bet you can write these rules, like the rules for endless screaming. Um, but what it can do is it can uh, use cheap bots and quick technology to, if somebody adds it, it will reply with its grammar. Uh, so if you at endless screaming, it will scream back at you. And so people will end up having these quite long conversations of just like screaming back and forth with infinite scream, or they'll have a new uh, story in their feed and they'll at infinite scream when they post that new story and then infinite scream will scream at that new story. Um, this is also really fun because you can get multiple bots that have this kind of level of interaction where it's, you know, okay, it's just kind of an echo bot. Like you say something to it or you bring it into the conversation and it'll just kind of do its part. Uh, so endless bees, I bet you can get what gets what endless bees does. It just goes buzz a lot. Um, somebody put endless uh, bees and endless screaming in conversation with each other. And so uh, screaming screamed and the bees buzzed and like it went on for quite a while. Uh, there's also a tiny care bot, which we'll be seeing later again. Um, but it posts uh, like sort of mental health reminders. And somebody put uh, very thoughtfully put tiny care bot in conversation with endless scream. So I don't think the therapy is working, um, but at least they're they're going to try kind of until the end of time, or at least until they run out of replies. So yeah, just to reiterate, the best characters are not necessarily the most technologically complex, um, but they're the ones that take advantage of clear improv principles, conversational techniques, and psychology to kind of invite you into their world. So this is a bot that I made. This is uh, called Everyone's an AI if you're an AI too. Uh, this is a fan bot for a book called Everyone's an Alien if you're an alien too. Um, and I, I won't go into the technology behind the little drawings, um, but the little drawings are sourced from um, the Google Quick Draw data set. Um, so these are little drawings of a spreadsheet drawn by actual human users um, that I then use as a database to create these little comics. Um, and then the comic text is made by Tracery as well. Uh, and you can see that like these got really popular, not because of the, the interesting technological stack, but because you know if you have a table that has a small frowny face on it and it is like saying that is like i'm confident and i'm bad and empty and i just want to be alone a lot of people feel emotionally connected to that table in that moment uh, and they'll start to retweet or like emotionally like vibe with that table so these are like like psychologically inviting the users in so yeah let's talk a little bit about how how do we invite users in how do we communicate with people um so there's this thing uh called blank page anxiety or just the fear of the blank page. It's a really commonly known issue in art um, or any sort of creativity where you start with a blank page and in that moment you can create anything. And of course, what do you do when you can create anything? You freeze up, you can't create anything. Um, and so a lot of art is like ways to deal with like the, the fear of the blank slate, like get something onto the page, get going, using prompts, using challenges, using Com uh, competitions or interesting contests uh, using like different forms of challenges. Um, but what we don't notice is when we accidentally create new blank slates. And so a lot of these uh, smart home device users, these kind of people who are making conversational agents uh, that can like 
live in little objects in your home and answer questions. Uh, they say, we're going to be really clever. Um, and we're going to say that like, here's this like little talking device, say anything. That's going to be amazing. Users are going to love that. Users are going to be like, just love to be told to say anything. And of course, what you do, what almost every user does is they just totally freeze up in front of it. Oh, I, I can say anything. Well, what am I supposed to say? Will somebody please tell me what to actually ask this thing? So it's, yeah, you know, go ahead, say anything. And then if you come up with something to ask about like four times out of five, um, sorry, you asked that wrong or I interpreted that wrong. Uh, so there's like, this is a very bad improv partner right here. And so, yeah, one of the, the hardest parts of conversation is, we know this, is thinking of things to say. And we know this because there's a lot of books about how to do this. Uh, just like, how do you do small talk? How do you converse with people? Um, and then for the artistic side, there's a lot of books of like, how do you get over your fear of making art? How do you get over the fear of blank slates? So we know that like the blank slate in conversation and art is, both of those are very difficult. Um, and so there's actually a bunch of really great techniques that we can pull from impro. Uh, this is the book that kicked off the study at improv theater. So if you've ever been to an improv art show or perhaps you actually have been done, have been doing some improv art, um, you know that this is kind of, you may know that this is the book that started off. So you'll be, we'll be using a lot of the terminology from this book, kind of like yes and in this talk today. Um, I'm not sure when it uh, gained the V. So the original book is impro and then it became improv. Um, so at some point it became like it got a letter V on it. Um, but yeah, one of the things about improv is they often talk about making offers. Um, so how do I, if I'm with a, with a group of other actors on stage and I want them to kind of create a scene with me, I will maybe provide an offer like, hey, we're pirates. And then they can decide whether or not to yes and that offer. So like, yes, we are pirates inside of an office building. Um, so that's saying yes. And then it's also kind of adding to the scenes like yes and. Um, and importantly, you can also just say like, yes, we're in an office building um, and here's the stack of paper that I'm working on. So you don't have to like raise the stakes every time. You can sometimes just kind of say the right answer. So yeah, we know that this actually works kind of in daily life as well because everyone sells these t-shirts. Um, you may have one of these t-shirts or you may have a t-shirt that kind of subtly hints at this. The t-shirt that you wear when you're going out somewhere and you want people to be able to approach you and talk to you but you don't want a t-shirt that says, say anything, because that's going to freeze people up. You want people to like know that there's a right answer when they come up and talk to you. Um, maybe not kiss me, I'm vaxxed. That's a little bit bold. But, you know, let's talk about plants. Let's talk about my podcast. Let's talk about wine. Let's talk about SIGGRAPH. Um, a lot of us have like interesting like nerd shirts, especially for like graphics things. It's like, oh, who want, who here notices that I'm wearing a Perlin noise shirt and wants to come up and talk to me about Perlin noise? I will talk about Pearl and Noise forever. So yeah, these are kind of shirts that make offers. So yeah, when, when we're building a relationship with somebody through conversation, like, you know, let's say that they've accepted my offer and we've started a conversation. Um, both of us, like the both conversers are kind of in their mind thinking of a couple of things. Like, do I trust this person with this conversation? Is this going to be a hard conversation, an easy conversation? Do I trust this person to keep it going? Or am I going to be the one that's like making, doing all the heavy lifting for this conversation? Um, is this person going to surprise me? Are they going to say non sequiturs? Are those going to be delightful non sequiturs? Like, oh, I, this is an exciting conversation. I didn't know it was going in this direction. Or like, oh no, I can't believe they just said this thing. Uh, how do I get out of this conversation? Um, and then also a lot of times you'll be thinking like, am I any good at this conversation? Um, one of the things that people always say about people who are very charismatic is that they make the other person in the conversation feel good and interesting. It's not that you are the most charismatic speaker if you are good and interesting, but if you felt like the, uh, if the other person after conversing with you feels like they were really good at that conversation, then you are actually a really good converser. Um, and this is really interesting because we start getting a lot of these, I know I say interesting a lot, um, but uh we get a lot of these therapy bots that people are starting to come up with now. Um, I forget which one this is. There's just kind of an endless array of bots that will do therapy at you um, or attempt to at least talk to you about kind of uh, it, your issues. Um, so how do you trust a bot when a bot says, hey, let's do some therapy. Uh, let's talk about your emotions. Do you trust that bot? Do you trust it to keep the conversation going? Is it going to surprise you in a good or bad way? You know, am I going to be able to do this conversation with this bot? I am really bad as a, uh, um, like, I'm very bad at conversing with the Google Assistant um, because it's 
not actually good at holding up a conversation, or maybe it's just that I don't know what I'm supposed to say to it. So I feel like I'm perpetually failing at Google Assistant conversations. And that makes me feel like we don't have a good relationship and I'm not willing to trust it with other things. So yeah, it's really interesting. Or like we can also talk about bootstrapping trust with conversation. Um, and one of the things about like bootstrapping trust is like, um, you don't start by asking people to trust you on big things. You start with asking them to trust you on very small things. And not just one small thing, you end up, uh, you can almost think of it as like, if this is like a conversation RPG, we have to kind of grind this conversation at like low level stakes for a while before we can build up to like a conversational boss level. And the way that we do this is with small talk, um, which is not in fact filler. Um, small talk is a series of small conversational volleys, kind of uh, conversations that go back and forth. Um, you know, so this is a conversation that I had with my neighbor recently, like, hello, hi, you can, you can tell if they're listening. Um, you can tell that they know your name. You can tell whether or not they're excited to continue this conversation. How are you? Like, you know, hey, we care for each other, don't we? Yes, yes, we do. Um, hey, let's share some like, there was weather last night. Yes, there was weather last night. Yes, we have a common thing in uh, in common. And then by the time you've done kind of those three volumes, you've successfully passed things back and forth. You can then ask them like for more interesting things. You can kind of like then moved on to higher conversational topics. Just saying like, I know, right? So yeah, this is all about kind of how do we build good improv partners? Um, and a good improv partner or scene will give you kind of a lot of these little offers or invitations. Um, one of the reasons that Harry Potter was so successful as a franchise is because it's just full of invitations. Like the world building of it is just like constantly full of invitations. Like, okay, we're all wizards in the wizard school. Like what house are you in? And you have one of four answers and you can just choose randomly. Um, what would your wand be made out of? And it's like, okay, well, I can kind of, you know, think about some interesting things. Like what kind of wand would I have? Do I feel like, you know, a, um, a like tall, sturdy person? Do I feel like kind of like short and powerful? Do I feel like delicate and magical? Um, you know, what's your patron patronus? Like what kind of, what do you feel represented by in the animal kingdom? Like even just like physical movements, like here's your wand and a broomstick. Like how do you move if you're like on a broomstick holding a wand? And we can kind of all imagine this. There's a lot of offers in that world that we can just accept and start like um, encouraging ourselves to be in conversation with this world. Um, but any kind of improv partner, as you're doing a lot of these small, low risk invitations, you build trust with that world or that partner or that scene. So yeah, when we think about bot characters, we can think about the invitations that they are extending. Uh, and I should start speaking a little faster now. Um, we can also think about what the yes and yes ands would be. And like, is there a clear good answer? Is there room to add or show off? So yeah, invitations and offers. I just wanted to show you a couple of bots that do different kinds of invitations. So one of my favorite kinds is take the prompt. So a bot that gives you a prompt and you decide whether or not you wanna like take that and run with it. So there's a lot of kind of uh, instrument description bots, art assignment bots. Uh, this is the instrument bot. Um, uh, oh, I don't have the instrument bot for this one, um, but this was a, uh, uh, an instrument made out of a hollow log and salt water. And somebody decided, and the person who made this bot actually decided that they were gonna in fact build an instrument out of a hollow log and salt water. Um, uh, this is um, graphic scores bot. This is Emma Winston who had the, the quote earlier about um, artists being into bots. Um, uh, she makes music and then like plays it uh, along with this kind of like tracery score. So yeah, there's a couple of other interesting projects. These are not um, Twitter bots, but they're still using tracery. This is Nicole Huzz, um, The Best Art, which gives you an art assignment. Um, and this art assignment was to make flower, fake flowers feel loved. And here you can see her presenting a beautiful bouquet of real flowers to her fake flowers. Um, this is Most Sincere Greetings Esteemed One by Dedrick Squinkifer and Jessica Marcotte, um, where you are encouraged to greet people in deeply bizarre ways that might feel kind of uncomfortable. Bots are really great for this because if it's weird or embarrassing, you can just let the bot take the blame. Um, you can think of um, uh, Twister as an early form of bot, um, where Twister says, okay, right hand red, you all try to put your right hands on red, and you get kind of up close and personal with people, but you can blame the bot for that. Uh, solve. This is kind of a fun one. Um, it, the bot gives you a seemingly impossible situation, and you, as the human, have to figure out the missing key to make it to make it make sense. This is great because if you find the thing, you feel like you've kind of helped the bot out in some way. You feel like you've closed a circle that was left open. Um, so here are three bots to do this. Um, on the right, we have infinite or endless jeopardy, which uh, 
I don't know if it uses tracery or not, but it generates these kind of um, randomly selected um, trace or like randomly selected Jeopardy questions or answers rather. Um, and then everybody replies to it with what they think the correct answer for a peculiar corporation that bought Hyundai or Hyundai. Uh, so Strange Rover was apparently like uh, the winner of that. And that was uh, upvoted the most times. And so that one won Endless Jeopardy. Similarly, Bot Pops does the same thing where it gives you uh, the first part of a joke. How does a tea light? Um, again, randomly generated. Uh, and then everybody tries to come up with the correct answers, uh, much like Endless Jeopardy as upvoted um, with little candles and aluminum cups. So this is the, the correct answer, which didn't exist until this point for this generated question. Um, here's one that I made. Um, it wasn't super successful, but I thought it was doing some kind of fun stuff. It makes uh, locked room murder mystery puzzles where it describes how the victim was found uh, and the idea is that you are supposed to come up with like what happened here. Um, so this one, the victim was found in a sauna um, and gripping a bag of quarters. And uh, somebody suggested this is in fact, they died from a coin operated time machine. So yeah, uh, another kind of variation of that is like imagine. So these are bots that encourage you to imagine things. Um, so often like, I'll, I'll, uh, the term that I've used before for these is imagination playground. You want something where it is difficult enough to imagine this, that your brain has to kind of make some interesting jumps. The jumps are like far enough to be interesting, but not so impossible that you can't figure out how to imagine it. Um, so this is Magical Realism Bot. Um, I don't know whether or not this uses, uses tracery, but it's using something similar um, where it cr like creates these little kind of things for you to think about. Like a girl kisses the sun inside a clockwork city. Um, a midwife writes a novel that is made out of chimneys. You can kind of imagine that. Like, what is a novel made out of chimneys? Um, an opera singer falls pregnant with postmodernism. Like, how are you pregnant with postmodernism? What does that mean to her? What does it mean that it's an opera singer? And then here's, in Munich, 98 lions are being tucked into bed. And a lot of people seem to like in, in enjoying imagining this. And so here are a couple of the responses that that got. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sleeping thinking about this. Um, did some of them fall off? These are like people kind of making up little additional stories. Like they've imagined the lions being tucked into bed. And then what would happen if you tried to tuck 98 lions into bed, especially in Munich? Um, unboxing. This is, you know, you can request a thing and then sometime later you get that thing and you can react to the surprise. Um, or rather like often the bot will just make things on a schedule and you'll be kind of surprised the next time the bot comes up with something. Uh, here are two competing emoji fart, uh, emoji fart bots that run in Chancer or in a uh, cheat bots done quick. Um, so you can see, like, it just like puts the little wind emoji next to a randomly selected emoji, but those have some kind of like fun emergent qualities. Um, you know, what does it mean for a donut to fart or for two people to fart? Um, you know, it's just like silly juxtaposition, but it's kind of fun for you to like imagine what that means, but also to be surprised, like every every six hours or once a day. Um, often on cheap bots done quick because these get posted in kind of batches. There's what's called bot o'clock, which is certain times of the day. You'll just get a row of like, if you follow a lot, of bot of a lot of bot accounts, you'll just get like a whole little row of exciting new strange things to unbox. Um, this was one, that, uh, again, that I made. Um, this is the uh, horrible Hogwarts history bot. Um, if you add it, it will tell you what your horrible Hogwarts life would have been. Because uh, it seems like a lot of kids die at Hogwarts. Um, so this is me kind of telling somebody their their story um, that in their fourth year they were they were killed by something that Hagrid bought on Craigslist um, and then like their remains resided in Hogwarts for much for a long period of time and were used in class studies uh, and then they like reacted to that so this is kind of similar to the unboxing videos that you get on on YouTube of people like hey I've got this thing what's inside the thing oh gosh wow that was such the thing that I was expecting or not the thing that I was expecting. Um, spoof. This is also kind of a, a fun one. This is like, if you want to say that the world is so surreal, you can no longer distinguish reality from bot made content. Um, so two examples of that are uh, tech headlines. So this is my bot over on the left. Um, this is somebody else's hipster cocktail bot over on the right. Um, and hipster cocktails and tech news are just so weird now that like you can just shove them into a blender and puree whatever comes in get new versions out and those things will be just as believable as the stuff that you get in a real store. And then anticipation. This is kind of one that maybe 
it doesn't do as much with like tracery stuff. It's not doing as, as much generative stuff, but it's kind of using the, the concept of these bots as cron jobs, like jobs that are run kind of periodically over time. It's using those as a way to make, like to invite people into the scene. So what does it mean to invite people into the scene with something that happens once a day? Um, this is, you, you know, you kind of wait for Big Ben to bong. Um, there's a bot there. Actually, I, I think I've heard that this is in fact not a bot, but just a person who posts every Thursday. Um, but there's a, a um, an account on Twitter that every Thursday posts the Russian doll uh, um, image of Thursday, what a concept, and everybody else like replies and is like, yes, Thursday. Um, so there's a lot of people that just, you know, look at this, like 5,000 tweets just celebrating the fact that it is Thursday and uh, that everybody was waiting for this tweet to come along. Um, this is an actual bot. This is um, the Every Word bot by Allison Parrish, uh, who's a famous bot maker. Um, and you can see that it is going through every word and it is posting every word in order um, from, you know, the most A word to the most Z word. And here we got to Zimmergy. Um, and then it posted Eclair. Uh, and you can see everybody just absolutely losing it. Um, sorry, I, I meant to bleep out all the, the F words in here. Um, but you can see everybody just freaking the heck out because every word bot, like they thought they had the pattern and then suddenly every word bot shifted things on them. So everybody kind of like, like an emotional, exciting moment happened here just because of the rhythm of this bot. Uh, and then my final favorite type, uh, excuse me, my final favorite type is encourage and sympathy uh, bots. So much like lost Tesla, a lot of people kind of like looked at lost Tesla and this, tweet, this bot is not going to hear you, um, but they still send it encouraging messages. Like you can do it, Tesla. Um, you know, I bet that you can like, I bet that you can make it home someday. Um, here's the tiny care bot that I mentioned earlier that was uh, in conversation with infinite screen. This is a bot that just like tells you to take care of yourself and you can follow it on Twitter and it will periodically tell you to take care of yourself. If you add it, it will give you a custom message to take care of yourself. So these are just bots that like, all they do is either they solicit kind of sympathy for people or they offer sympathy to people, which I think is kind of a neat space to work in. Um, and yeah, here's infinite screaming um, and it seems to be reacting to your timeline. So yeah, here are just a couple of the different ways that you can use bots. Um, but importantly, all these are telling the user how to experience your bot, like what's going to be happening here? Like, how am I supposed to incorporate this bot into my world? Like what role do I play in this bot's world? Um, and if you want to learn more about bots or you'd like to see like lots, lots, lots more bots, um, there's a group called, or a person who makes a site called botwiki.org and you can browse just lots of bots. Um, if you scroll down a bit from here, uh, there's a category entirely for tracy, tracery bots if you wanna see more tracery bots. So yeah, um, I'm going to do a tracery tutorial now uh, and hopefully it'll work. I just pushed it live this morning, so we're gonna find out. But before we do that, are there any questions? I didn't see any, oh wait, that's private chat. Let's see. Okay. Um, so it doesn't look like we have any questions up yet. Um, so yeah, I will just kind of show us a little bit about how to make a tracery bot. Um, so hey, this is artbot.club. This is a site that I've been working on. It's just me working on the site. Um, I wanted to have something where people could make bots and like look at other people's bots. Um, so right now it's just for uh, kind of editing your own tracery grammars. Um, and we can see if we wanted to make this into a cheap Boston quick bot, I can copy this. So here's my grammar over here on the right. This is just a JSON object. So if I wanted to see my JSON object, I can copy that. I can go over here to cheap Boston quick, which is currently running that uh, technology um, headline bot um, under Kate's bot, which is just my experimental bot. I can delete all that. I can paste this in here. So here's my grammar in here. And notice that now I can have a variety of different little tweets. Oh, and if I wanna have it, different tweets, that. Sorry, Kate, I don't mean to yeah. interrupt. Um, <clears throat> so, sorry, were you saying the Artbot Club stuff that you've just pushed, is that, can people check that out online mm -hmm. now? Or, yep. Yes, okay, please. Cool. Uh, if you, Excellent. you can see, I'm just here on Art, hopefully you can see that I'm here on artbot.club. Cool. So feel Excellent. free to go to the site and follow along. Um, again, because I pushed it this morning, there might be some exciting, like, exciting new things, solo software life, you know how it is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I can put that on cheap pasta on quick. Um, 
I can go until I find one I like. I, I can tweet this and hopefully it will then have, oops, oh, oh, auth failure. All right, Twitter is being obnoxious. Hopefully that would eventually like then tweet. Um, so I could set that up. And that's all you need to make your own Twitter bot is you need this little grammar here. You need chop, cheap bots on a click and you need a Twitter account that is not currently throwing errors, which apparently mine is. This is Twitter's, Twitter's welcoming bot technology, I'm afraid. All right, so back to like making your bot because um, we're gonna be working. That's just like, okay, if you wanna put your bot on Twitter, you can immediately do that. Um, no waiting required. But now we're actually gonna make our bot a little bit more interesting. So here's my bot grammar. Um, these things are called symbols. This is a, we have a key here that is the word origin and then a set of rules. Currently the only rule for origin is hello world. Um, and here's a symbol for hello. Uh, and we can see that the expansions for hello are the word hello, hi, hola, bonjour. Um, I forget what that Russian word is, ni hao, um, waving, um, and I think merhaba um, in Arabic, um, which I don't read, but I pasted it in. Um, so yeah, this is a tracery grammar. Um, we can see that we're starting with origin. So this is like, how many versions of that origin am I creating? And it's kind of hard to see what's going on here, but we're gonna try something that is gonna make it a little bit more tracery-like. We are going to add a, uh, a socket, which is the kind of hashtag syntax. So if instead of saying hello, I say hello in hashtags, notice what just happened. Suddenly, instead of having it be like all hellos, I've got all these different ones. So I can change how many of those I'm seeing. So like, look, there's a whole bunch of different little traces through this grammar. Oops, a um, whole bunch of little traces through this grammar. Um, I can set it back down to just having five. Um, and then if I want to reroll it, you can see that I can just like reroll as many, like I can randomly generate as many more of these like little snippets as I want. So what I thought I'd do today is to create a, uh, a description of the 2022 um, SIGGRAPH Gallery of Art. So I want to say like, you know, instead of hello world, I'm going to say, um, the graph gallery of 2022. And notice that we currently have an empty gallery. So maybe you could say like, well, I'm going to create some number of pieces of art. So I can say, I'm going to have some art in hashtag, and then I'm going to have a, um, a break and I'll show you what that does in a moment. Really just to uh, make a new line and hashtag art. There we go. So I got some art, some art and some art. Oh, and I'll put a break there. So yeah. Um, notice that I'm currently, I have this button pressed. This means uh, please interpret this tracery output as HTML. So that allows me to um, make, make like nice styling here because you can't put um, enter, like you can't hit enter in the middle of your rules because of JSON. All right, so we have our SIGGRAPH gallery with three arts. Um, notice that art here, even though I've got it in hashtags up here, it's currently being placed in double parentheses, which is Tracery's way of letting you know that like, hey, you haven't finished specifying this symbol, um, but that's okay. I know you're an artist and you're very busy. Um, I'm just gonna keep rolling anyways. So this is not like a lot of programming languages where if you have an error, it's gonna stop and not do anything. Tracery just kind of wants to roll with it because it knows you're you're gonna be making stuff in parts. So now let's let's go ahead and make some art for our SIGGRAPH art gallery. We're gonna make some art. Um, and I think, let's see, what kind of art should we make? We could make a video installation. Uh, we could make a game, make a demo, make a sculpture. And maybe a projection. Okay, we got some we got some new kinds of art here. Um, but maybe like these are kind of not that exciting. So maybe I'll say like, you know, actually, I'm going to say that these are um, mediums for art. And instead, my art is going to be made out of, let's see, how about a medium about a subject? Notice I'm creating more symbols here. 
if it's a medium, about the ocean. Uh, maybe it's about recycling. Maybe about cryptocurrency. The future. Or justice. But yeah, so we can see we've got like a game about the ocean, sculpture about the ocean, sculpture about justice. So you can start kind of like making these things. Um, and, you know, you can add more uh, like different things. Um, maybe an art complication. Um, and art complications are things like um, made by, by actors. Um, in virtual reality. Uh, on a 3D printed surface. But really it's just a tech demo for a company. Uh, Cam, how much longer do we have? Test, test. Okay, about 15 minutes. Cool, yeah. So I just wanted to kind of like show y'all how we're, how we're making this. Um, you can add lots of uh, HTML tags in here if you like. So we can have, okay, we've got all this. Um, maybe we can give each of these artworks a title. Um, or actually, ooh, you know what we're gonna do now? Notice I've got like a demo um, about this. Oh, and I'll I'll add in uh, an AR game for reasons that you will see in a moment. Uh, and interactive movie. All right, so I've got all of these artworks, but I wanna say like, okay, well, this is kind of abrupt. I want to say like, these are a demo, a game. So, okay, well, I'll change art to, it'll be a medium about subject. Like, uh-oh, uh, AR game. Uh, it should be an AR game, right? Well, there's a bunch of things that you might want to change about words uh, so frequently um, that I figured, hey, I'm going to write these into tracery as modifiers. So you can say, if you have your symbol key here, this is the medium, this is going to be my like, AR game, etc. cetera, um, I can start modifying that by adding dot, um, dot something after it. So I say, okay, like dot A, that'll put A or an in front of things. So you can see we now have an AR game. Um, maybe I'd also like to capitalize that. So how about we capitalize that? But yeah, so this is a video installation about the ocean played by live actors. Um, so maybe I can kind of keep going deeper in here. Um, I could say, oops. Controlled by agent. You're gonna have some, some agent. And maybe that's a Twitter bot. User, online participant. Cat. All right. Let's see if you got any of those. Yeah, a video game installation about the future as controlled by cats. And here we've got, uh, let's see, where is that? Yep. Controlled by agent.s, which pluralizes cats to the best of its ability. It's not doing anything super complicated here. So, yeah, that's how you do modifiers. Um, now I could also say, let's see. Um, Yeah, we can, I'll show you a little bit about push pop notation. This is like, okay, well, I want to have something where um, I use the same word multiple times. So maybe in addition to art, I'm going to say, in addition to this art, I'm going to say, let's, um, let's make an art where we push something onto my agent. So this is a, a symbol that doesn't exist yet, but I'm going to, when it gets to this rule and expands out this rule, I want it to push something to this value. So I want you to like save some data. So I'm going to say, save an agent. Oops, an agent. This will 
expand out this rule and then stuff its value into a new um, symbol called my agent. And then if I said like agent, 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 Oh, my agent, because that's what I used. There we go. Cat, cat, cat. Online participant, et cetera. So you can see that like one symbol is repeating multiple times. What you can do with that is you can say like, okay, um, I want to say, um, let's see, this is going to be a medium for agent or my agent dot s. where the my, my agent is evil. So just as we're sort of like running low on time, I just wanted to like show you like, okay, a demo for online participants where the online participant is evil. Um, a sculpture for cats where the cat is evil. Um, so yeah, a, an AR game for users, but where the user is evil. Um, so you can kind of see like how you just expand this out to make more and more complicated stuff. Um, if you'd like to see some examples of how this works, um, we can browse to, I can save this. Um, and we can browse a couple of the other examples that we have in here. So here's an example of a story. Um, so we have an origin with, you can see that we're saving a bunch of stuff and then like uh, we're storing a my name, a my place, and then we use my name and my place a bunch of times. There's a lot of uh, rules here. Um, and then we can also kind of browse over here if you want to look through like, hey, here's this uh, grammar and it seems to be quite long. I'm having trouble scrolling here. Well, let's just go straight to like the object so we can now see like, okay, we're now an object. I can see that here's all the, the options for object. Um, I can switch to object adjective. But if I look at origin, uh, we can actually see it uh, sort of translated out here. So you can see like, okay, here's a my name, a my place, and a my name. Um, and then I'm getting, I'm using those kind of down here in this template. Um, and here's object, and it's getting an A modify on it. Um, so yeah, I've got a bunch kind of in here. Here's a a conference, if you'd like more examples of like how to generate automatic conference titles. Um, here is a digital media uh, conference generator. Um, so this is kind of the like final version of the SIGGRAPH uh, art generator that we, that we were just building. Um, so you can see like, okay, here's a workshop on digital media, tele-interrogating a drama performed on a virtual boy, which the user navigates with a DDR mat. Um, flash stabilizing, Roman imperialism in the basement of the British Museum is explored with the American dream as instantiated on a twine game. Um, and then if you're like, well, how does that work? Now uh, you can start browsing through things. Now here's what conferences are. Let's see. Place. Oh yeah. The Area Institute of Subject. The Subject Institute of Area. We're the conference on subject. Um, let's see. Digital artifacts. Let's see. So yeah, you can just kind of like open up some of these examples. Oh, here we, here we go. These are, this is like, what is a project made out of? It's lit, literary device and literary device. Tell the story of abstract thing and the digital artifact about a protagonist. So you can kind of often like write these almost like you're writing in plain English. Um, yeah, and then you can just see uh, a bunch of different things. Here's a uh, sci-fi um, generator if you like, if you like some sci-fi. Um, this has some good like, uh, See, I think. Oh, and you can also you can change the size of stuff. Um, yeah, here's here's science blargle. Um, so here are like different ways to make some science blargle if you need some science blargle in your um, uh, in your sci-fi generator. So yeah, um, that's really just how to use Artbot Club. Um, you're welcome to use it just over here in the JSON editor if you're comfortable using like editing stuff in JSON. Um, you can also edit in here and rearrange your symbols in whatever order suit you. Um, and you can also edit them uh, directly, like directly in here. Um, and it all, all updates live. So yeah, 
Um, that is that is our pot club. Um, I'm going to continue to work on it. Um, I'm hoping to have it be like a place where people could like host interesting bots as opposed to just looking at my bots over and over again. Um, but it'll at least allow you to try making your own bot. Um, look at all the different interesting generations that it uh, can end up with. Um, kind of smash that reroll button as many times as you want. Uh, and yeah, um, let's switch to a discussion. Amazing. Um, thank you so much, Kate. That was that was excellent. I have a gazillion questions I could ask you, but we've only got a few minutes. Yeah, so sorry. I just no, 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 no. Uh, don't don't be sorry. Um, Twitter's becoming a bit of a hard place for us to put our bots out, as you kind of touched on. Um, where where should we go instead? Where do you think bot makers should maybe um, be putting their their works up instead? Yeah, there's a lot of different places you can cast squirrel bots around. I know there's um, tools to build bots in Slack and Discord. Um, so mm -hmm. maybe your bot isn't going to have an audience of 100,000 people, but maybe it'll at least have, you know, a few people that you are delighting with your bot among your friend group or whoever is stuck on Slack with you. Um, I'm obviously trying to make Art Bot Club into something. There's also bots that are on Mastodon, but I find Mastodon, if, if my goal is to get a uh, tracer in the hands of casual users, Mastodon is not a place uh, for for people to just try out a little bit of Mastodon. Um, it can be a little bit intimidating, although it is a very powerful place for people to kind of build their own Twitter. So we'll see. There's not a there's not a good answer just yet. Um, mm. A bunch of us are trying each in our own way to make a place for bots, but I think the the era of bots being on Twitter is it's not over, um, mm. but it's not as easy as it used to be. Which is a sad thing when you when you've created your first bot and it immediately gets banned. A lot of people get very disheartened by that. Yes, yeah, definitely. Um, cool. Yeah, I on that note about um, Mastodon and kind of casual users and stuff. Um, your focus really, you do have a big focus on on making tools, as you say, for people who aren't maybe traditionally computer um, coders or scientists or whatever you want to call them. Um, how did that focus kind of come about? Yeah, I some of it was working on Spore. So Spore really set the the focus of my research because we when we made Spore, we would literally get handwritten letters from people who said that they had written themselves off creatively. Um, and that this wow. derpy little game with, where you could build monsters and see the monsters kind of flail about in a generated world, um, that that building those little monsters had made them feel like they had permission to be creative again. And it's kind of it's like what Bob Ross does is like it, he gives you permission to make accidents. He gives you permission to do things badly. Um, and there's this whole cottage industry of just like, how do you give people permission to be creative? And that that's not as like true if you're say working at Pixar or getting a PhD in it. Um, and so mm. it just is kind of naturally a really good fit for, um, you know, when you're, when you're trying to become the Bob Ross of AI, um, working with kind of everyday users becomes the thing that you really ought to be paying attention to. Um, and I just find it like extremely rewarding uh, for people mm. to to tell me that like this was the thing that let them, that gave them permission to be in this field, that gave them permission to be creative. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, that's really cool. Um, so yeah, we've got like a tiny bit of time. So I just wanted to mention one comment that we got was from F Burton 8 who said that, they have written a tracery um, that generates plot outlines for the TV show House. Nice. Um, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, do you remember a while ago there was that big thing of people posting up saying like, oh, I, I forced an AI to watch 10,000 hours ah, of Saw yeah, Olive Garden guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was interesting because that wasn't necessarily a bot really, was it? it, was, was, it was well, it was a person. It was 100% a person. Um, I don't even know if they were doing anything like bot related. Um, there's also the people, oh gosh, I'm blanking on their names now, but they did the Harry Potter generator. Um, Botnik? Uh, yeah, Botnik. Yeah, they're really interesting because um, despite their name, they are not um, robots uh, and they are emphatically, like they put themselves out there. Like we are not robots. And yet every article about them is like, a robot has written Harry Potter. They are yeah. a group of comedians. And then they also build tools that allow them to do uh, interesting generative stuff. And then like comedians select the best stuff, comedian tweak the best stuff. So it's even better. And then also have a group of about a hundred people kind of loosely connected to through some really interesting technological pipelines, um, all bubbling up interesting ideas. And so this like massively networked organism made out of comedians. 
which I find a really fascinating space. So I, I think those are much more interesting than like somebody just kind of putting on a bot face and saying like, look at me, I'm so random, I'm a bot. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can make definitely. random bots, but you know, it, his stuff like was much more coherent than a bot would normally write. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay, amazing. Um, that's eight o'clock. Thank you so much, um, Kate. Um, I'm sure I'm sure that you're going to get bombarded with questions on Twitter after this. Yeah, um, feel free to like ping me on Twitter. I'm I'm happy to direct people to whatever resources they need to like start their bot making journey in whatever direction you'd like. Cool. Awesome. Um, again, thank you so much, and um, have a wonderful rest of your day. Yeah, thanks and so thank much you for everyone watching. Thank you, Kate. At SIGGRAPH 2020, more than 10,000 individuals from 95 countries gathered virtually to experience over 350 hours of content presented by more than 1,600 contributors. What resulted was pure SIGGRAPH. Robotic advances use subtractive fabrication techniques to carve foam and similar materials like an artist. Modeling and predictive computation creates a more robust and accurate time stepping of nonlinear elastodynamics. New investigation into damage simulation could change the landscape of video and game effects as well as surgical training. Novel healthcare technologies point toward new ways to transform and enhance lives. Research will help users to create reprogrammable multicolor textures made from a single material. AI-driven technology pushes the capabilities of crowd simulation. Award-winning animation showcases the latest in computer graphics. Real-time and gaming technology advancements transform interactive storytelling techniques and explore new applications of the technology. Evocative digital artwork uses machine learning to create visceral experiences. Now is the time to share your research, your innovations, and your creative inspiration. SIGGRAPH is your community, and we hope you'll share your work with SIGGRAPH 2021.